Romans chapter 7. We started Romans chapter 7 last week and through the first six verses of Romans, uh, we talked about how Paul, as any good teacher, uh, speaks in illustrations, analogies, parables. It's what Jesus did. It's what good teachers do. Uh, they will draw a comparison between a lesson and something in our lives that apply that gives us a visualization. Well, Paul has been used in several of these because he is he is just uh, just beating every leaf on the bush to cover all the bases to make sure that the Jews and even the Gentiles in Rome would understand that we do not work under a merit system. Now, the reason I say the merit system instead of the law is because the Jews would use the law as their merit system, their scoring system with God, and anybody, even non-Jews, have a tendency to work in the merit system. It's what we do. And for the most part, it's appropriate. You know, in the merit system, the one who works the hardest is supposed to get the raise, or the one who is most competent gets the raise, and these things are, 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 we work on the merit system. Now, sometimes that's why we get upset whenever somebody's violating the merit system. I work harder that person, that person got the raise. The reason we got upset is because, hey, that's not fair. Why? Because we weigh things under the merit system. That's just what we do. And Paul is constantly having to battle that, whether Jew or Gentile, says that that's not the way it works with God. So one of the analogies he uses going to the law in the first few verses of chapter 7, he said that, you know how whenever a, a woman is married to her husband and uh, her husband dies, she's no longer obligated to her deceased husband. She's free to marry again. You know, she's, and that's, that makes perfect sense. He says, so you used to be married to the law, but the law has now been replaced. That is, it's dead. You died. Now, the law is the law, but you died with Christ. Christ died is what Paul says in these first few verses here. And we have been raised with him. So we died with him. And so because of just like that death made the covenant between that husband and wife no longer uh, uh, obligated. This frees us now, to he said, to be married to another. That is Christ. And so this means everything, but doesn't necessarily clarify anything. Not necessarily. And, and what we're doing is we're going through, we're going through one of the most critically important, necessary truths in the word of God, in the kingdom of God, in the relationship with God that we must embrace to be able to grow in the Lord. And that is exactly where Paul is going, because having talked about the law and how the law uh, did not accomplish what we would have thought it would have accomplished, he says that it didn't bring fruit your old situation scenario, it did not bring fruit. And that's actually uh, what he said in Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. This is what it says. And we read this last week. That the righteous requirements of the law, the law's requirements were righteous, they're good and holy, but the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I'm in the wrong chapter. Okay, chapter 7. With you guys, I'm like, that's good stuff, but that does not fit. Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. I was like, that has nothing to do with what I just said. Therefore, my brethren, verse 4, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you might be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead. What? So that we should bear fruit to God. If he's drawing the comparison between being um, uh, married to the law and now moving from that, remember we talked about this, hold on to this and let's go through this every week as we continue to go through Romans. God did not just save us from sin. I'm grateful that he saved us from sin because the wages of sin is death. But God did much more than save us from something. He saved us to something that God has a plan and agenda. And Paul is pointing to that. Because we just want to think, hey, you know what? I've been saved from sin. And that's Romans chapter 1 through 5. And that's where a lot of people stop. But you see where Paul's going here. He's going further than that to say, that's just what God did initially. 
is to save you from sin and save you from sin because of your faith. But he now plans on taking you to something. He saved you from something to take you to something. And he's saying this old situation didn't bear fruit. So there is something on God's agenda. Now, is God's agenda important? Or is our agenda important? Our agenda is our agenda could simply be, hey, just save me from sin so I don't have to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Maybe God has bigger aspirations than just stopping you from going to hell. Have you ever thought of the possibility that God has something more in store than just saving you from hell? I want you to know something. There, that is not what God's trying to do. He's trying not to save you from something. He's trying to save you to something. And I say try because He is giving us the free will opportunity to accept or reject. He's doing everything not willing that any should perish. He's doing His part, but not just to save you from hell, to save you to something. And it's to a relationship with Him so that you can be in Him, He in you, and you all have this fruitful and beautiful relationship. And Paul's saying the other one didn't work. He says this in verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. These are verses we covered last week that we need to make sure we understand as we're moving forward. Now, before we get into that, I want us to understand, knowing that the law was fruitless, that it's so important that we understand how the law failed. The law is good and holy and right, but it still failed. And how we think today, again, I want to remind you and challenge you that you don't miss the opportunity to hear and learn from God today thinking, you know what, I know we don't obey the law. That is for some other people somewhere. I know that and I'm just going to sit here and, and, and I'll catch up whenever there's something applicable for me. But I want us to think about this. The law was a written list of do's and don'ts. Scales on which the Jews weighed their position before God. See, the thing is, is that based on how well they did, they had this complete list of do's and don'ts. Now, that, now we, uh, that's something worth pointing out. It's not just a list of don'ts. And that's the way that people still think of their relationship with God. I don't do this and I don't do that. I don't do this and I don't do that. It's, 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 it wasn't even just that it's a list of do's and don'ts. The law itself that we're not married to anymore was a list of do's and don'ts. And the Jews liked it. And the reason the Jews liked it was because it, 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 it was something they could use for scoring. It was a way for them to use as a merit system saying, how well I obey the law brings me closer or further away from God based on my merit and my performance. That's why we use the term works. And based on their works. And you can see those who were disobedient, they are way far away from God. And you look at the obedience, they weren't perfectly obedient. That's why it's a little bit red on the bottom there. But they were a lot better than anybody else. And so they were probably pretty good with God. By comparison to some other people, they're probably just good with God. And see, you know what? That's the way so many people worked then and they work today. You know the difference between the way it was done then and the way it's done now? is they worked under the written law where we now, even though we're not supposed to, we work under an unwritten law. An unwritten list of do's and don'ts. We know that there's no written list. We have an unwritten list of do's and don'ts. And those are scales on which we weigh our position before God. See, we went from the law. You see the difference? Go back and forth. What's the difference? Nothing. There's no difference between the two. They're both... They're both our way of weighing out how well we do in the marriage system. And if we do pretty good compared to somebody else, we're probably okay with God. I'm going to be okay with God because I, I know some people who are way over there on that disobedient side. And they are so far away from God. I mean, my goodness, look at them. God is going to be way more happier than me with me than He is with them. And Paul is saying, that is not how this works. Don't you plan on that. Don't you take that to the bank. That check will not cash. That is not the way that God is working. He wasn't working in that way then. And He's not working that way now. 
Yet we do that every day. We, there will be people today who will make decisions based on whether or not they came to church this morning. There will be people who might watch something on TV or I mean, what's right and wrong might have to do with I did pretty good already today. I went to church. See what I'm saying? We do this. We really do. I think we all of us do it. At one time or another, we have this, uh, uh, this, this, this natural attachment to the merit system that says, I've done something pretty good today, therefore there must be some kind of uh, a slack for me to do differently later this afternoon. It is a problem that we need to move from because it was a fruitless um, a system and it didn't work for us. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Now that's a, that's a, a verse that you really need to think on for a second. Because here it says that the, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members. When we were in the flesh, I want us to understand what's happening right here. It says when we were, what does that mean? Whenever it says were, that means not now. This is who we were. Paul is talking about the pre-converted individual. It says, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. I want us to think about this word sinful passions. The sinful passions, mainly this word passions, and I said there we'd have some vocabulary words. Okay, here's one, a mental note to make of. And, and, and you can always get a copy of my notes. I saved them all, and if you want them, you can have them. The, the passions comes from this Greek word, pathema. It's only used 16 times in the Greek. And when we think of the sinful passions, I want us to understand what that means so that we'll understand what the verse means. The sinful passions that were aroused by the law. It's unfortunate there are some Bible versions that interpret as sinful desires. That's not what that word means. The word passion used right there, it's only used 16 times in the Bible. And every time that it's used, it's used as suffering. It's actually the word that, that we talk about the passion of the Christ, even which the name of uh, the movie was made from. It's suffering. It's affliction. Now, that's important. Now, we're going to talk about sinful desires, but that's not actually what he's saying right here. This is a word. I like what the Aramaic Bible in plain English uses. It says the disease of sin, the sinful disease. You could even say the infirmities of sin. What it is, it's it's this this symptoms that were activated, that word aroused. I want us to see that it's going to be coming back up. In different forms, aroused in verse 5, produced in verse 8, revived, sin was revived in verse 9. It was activated, it was aroused by the law, and the, which were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So this, this sinful affliction and suffering were symptoms that led to our death. And this is the effect that sin has on our life. But it says that it was aroused by the law. Now that could confuse some people. And Paul's going to address that. But going to verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law. Having died to what we were held by. So that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter. And that's going to be so important. As we are going forward. As we conclude this chapter next week. And going in to the weeks to come. That this newness of the spirit. And the way in which we serve God. Is, is, is the critically important piece to understand. And to grab. But I think it's a process. Of growing in an understanding. And growing in the experience. Experiences of walking in the spirit with God and the spirit of Christ inside of us that happens in our lives. But we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. We were captives. Remember, there was like a a, 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 a a slave owner that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter. If we are not to be the servants of, of the law, what good was the law? Paul is doing what he always does is he's thinking a step ahead. Any good lawyer in a courtroom when he's trying a case, trying to prove his case, he's doing chess with somebody and he's saying, I know where you're going to go when I say this, so I'm going to go ahead and address that. And Paul's going to be addressing this too because he knows that people are going to say, well, then what good was the law? 
What shall we say in verse 7? What what should, should we say? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, just the opposite. I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now I want us to think about that word for a minute. There are going to be words like covet and lust that's going to come up in these passages. And I want us to know the truth about what these words mean. The word lust and covet. They are, are, you, are words that were translated into English as lust and covet to talk about any time desires were evil. The actual Greek word that, they're, that they're, they're translating it from is a neutral word. It's just desires. It could be desires good. The same word that's translated here, here as lust is the same word Jesus used when He said, I desire to eat this Passover with you. It's the exact same word. Now, the exact same word that says that to not covet in the Old Testament is the exact same word that it says that God coveted a relationship with us. The difference between the way that we use these in English, covet and lust, and this is important. Hold on with me. If I've lost you, come back for a minute. Coveting and lust is just the way that we interpret this word desire, but the word is neutral. The word desire when it's inappropriate, when it's wrong. See, can have, I can have a desire for what is good, or I can have a desire for what is bad. Now, Paul says this. He says that, he says, the law is good. He says, I would not have known sin, verse 7, except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. See, man's will is not sin until it's confronted with an opposing will of God. That's important because every one of us are born and we come into this world with a will. It's a will to please me. And it's not necessarily wrong. It's, it's not wrong. Whenever we're a baby, we're like, ah, feed me, feed me, ah, change me. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. And yet none of us go, look at that horrible little baby over there. Just always thinking of itself. No, it's whenever that baby begins to grow and becomes a young child and it begins to realize that there's other people's will that sometimes contradict your will. It's what you do then. That's what it really comes down to. And that's what Paul is saying right here. He says that that man's will is not sin until it is confronted with the opposing will of God. See, the law of God is the revealed will of God. God's law is his will. It says, this is what I want. And Paul's saying, man, I had not known that my will was in opposition of God's will until he told me what his will was. And I realized it was a conflict with my will. But praise God, I'm glad now I know what the will of God is. But it says this, he says, I would not have known. He said, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. Now, this is going to get a little bit deeper. But I want us to realize that the arousal is said in in verse six of the the law aroused the sin is when we realize that our will we know what our will is because we don't nobody needs to explain that will to us but once the will of god comes into our lives and we realize that our will is in opposition of god's will it's at that point then that the problem begins Because at that point then, this is where all of us have been guilty. Where we have all been guilty of seeing, okay, now I know and understand I'm guilty. And I hope some other people will admit it. I'm guilty of saying, I now know and understand what is the will of God. I now realize that that is a contradiction with my will. And they're contrary one to the other. And yet I chose, when it came down to it, I chose my will. I chose my way. And see, because of that, the law aroused. Once I knew, once I was aware that my will was in opposition of God's will and my will was the road that I took, then sin, because of the law. See, I didn't know till the law came. But once the law came, then I knew. See, the law aroused all of this inside of me and I found it that it was actually bringing and working in me death. Because now I am in disobedience and I am against God and the results of that and the fruit of that is death. And that's what Paul has been saying all along. But see, I'm grateful that this law aroused. Aroused in me. It revived. Something happened as a result of that because 
this word arouse is, is, it's not that it was the actual thing that, that, it's not the actual death. It's what aroused the symptoms. See, the law provoked, aggravated, uh, and, and, and irritated and activated the, the fruit unto death. See, once the law came, it caused symptoms in my life to where now I see and I should know that there's a problem. And I'm grateful for symptoms. Because so for somebody that has had a heart attack, they would be grateful for the chest pains. See, the chest pains was a sign. There's all a whole list, a long list of, of various systems, symptoms that if we learn these symptoms, they're saying there's a problem. There's a problem. And Paul's like, man, I'm so grateful. No, there's nothing wrong with the symptoms. There's nothing wrong with, or there's nothing wrong with the law. There's nothing wrong with, with the, the law provoking the symptoms for me to be able to see. So when the law provokes and the law produces and revives these things, it's very important. It says that, in verse 8, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. Look at this relationship, he's saying. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me. That's the law. God's showing me what His will is. Producing me all, all manner of evil desire. Now, wait a second. Come on, sin. You had evil desire prior to the law, Paul. Paul is not saying that at all. He's saying I had desire, but it becomes evil desire. It becomes lust and covetousness when I'm aware of the will of God and I, um, I want my will over His will, then it becomes evil. And it wasn't evil until then. It says, it, now it was sin, but it wasn't what he's talking about here. But sin taken opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. So now Paul, in addition to saying that the law doesn't justify us before God, it condemns us. Put that scale back up there. The scale of the law. So not only did our performance not only not bring us closer to God, the law actually showed how far away we were from God. And this is not the way that the Jews perceived the law. And it's not the way that we perceive, perceive our law, the scoring system today. Our scoring system, just like the law, is saying, I still work based on this merit system of how good I am to God. And God is saying, no, I'm showing you just how far away you are from me. The law didn't. It says, well, by sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, verse 8, produced in me all manner of evil desires. See, the law didn't didn't make me have evil desires. The law made the desires evil. Okay? Think about that. The law didn't make me have evil desires. The law made the desires evil. Once I become aware that what I want to do, my will is in conflict with God's will, and I want to do it anyway, then that is lust. Then that is covetous. This is, this is going against the will of God. The revealed will of God and my will was contrary to His and now things get serious. In our society, when there's a conflict of wills, we have this philosophy that I had, I had a, a, a lady uh, one time and she, she was, I'm not picking on women, she was just a woman. Um, and there was an issue with her that was very offensive. I, it, was, it was something that was wrong, and and and, uh, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not always loving, but I was loving, and that and I and I approached her in a particular way and said, uh, "This is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. This is wrong. This is a, a real problem." And she thought about it, and then her solution was that this is just who I am. This is just who I am. And she rejected any kind of change as that's not my problem. See, this is really what we do. And this is really what's pushed in America today is if they don't accept you for who you are, and then they determine what acceptance is, they don't accept you for who you are, it's their problem because if somebody really loves you, they will accept you for who you are. Now, I know that a lot of preachers will tell you Jesus accepts you just as you are. Maybe we don't understand what that means. Jesus only accepts those who are broken before him and saying, I surrender to you. He doesn't accept them any other way. 
I, he I accepts them as broken before him and willing to surrender. It doesn't mean that they're perfect and flawless by any means. So if a preacher says he takes you as you are, he's saying he knows that you're broken is what they're saying. The preacher's saying he knows that, that you need to be fixed. But you have to be at the point where you say, I'm broken and I need to be fixed before God. And that's the way he takes it. But this, this particular person, they became aware that it was an offense. Now, you can decide whether... That, I mean, they, the person didn't deny that it was wrong. But they did not deny that, that they needed to change. Let me give you this example. Okay, and this is important. And, and I think if we learn to think like this in our relationship with God, it can make a big difference. If I am offending my wife somehow, and I'm not aware of it, maybe it's something I'm doing. Boy, I'm getting close to home now. Maybe it's something that I'm doing. It, it's an offense to her. See, it's a sin to her. It, it, it's, it's something that's, that's hurtful to her, but she knows I'm not aware of it, okay? She, and, and we've been in these situations, married or not. We've been in situations and relationships with people. She knows that I'm not aware of it, but she sits me down one day and she says, Honey, baby, and she always talks to me in such a loving way, like, like, just like that, right? And she says, this thing that you, you're saying or this thing that you're doing is an offense to me. But see, up till now, she really didn't count it against me. See, she, she was, it wasn't, as the Bible says, it wasn't imputed against me. It was wrong. I mean, it was hurting her all along. But until it was made aware, and I was made aware of it, see, then I have this situation at hand now. Where my will is now in opposition of her will. And see, now I can make a decision based on whether, hey, you know what, it's your problem, get over it. Or I can make a decision that, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. Now see, this is what's happening with God. And this is what Paul is painting right here. Is that at one time, I was like Steve not knowing that he was offending Michelle. But see, Michelle has now sat down with us and thank goodness for her having sat down with us. Thank goodness for the law now revealing to me what the will of God is so that I can know that I have a problem. See, I remember uh, uh, being in a, in a construction job and this has happened a bunch of times. Been, and it was a guy that I had to work very, very closely with. And he just, boy, he cussed like a sailor. No offense to any sailors, but y'all know what y'all's problem is. And so he, and he, had, he was very, very, very vulgar. And most of the time, I would just, you know what? Hey, it's, I'm on a job site. That's the way people talk. I don't go around acting um, uh, like uh, non-Christians are supposed to behave like Christians. I accept that. But we were, we were working so closely together, and I was offended by some of the things that he would say about God as far as, you know, uh, slanderous things and, and vulgar things. And I asked him if he wouldn't say that anymore because it offended me. Now, once I... Once I came up to that point of asking him or talking to him about it. There was a lot of, you know, patience that I had towards that. And I was hoping that there would be, you know, at least some kind of, of respect towards me. But his attitude was that he didn't give a GD, what I thought. See what I'm saying? Then, matter of fact, he, he didn't, he knew then that it offended me. And then when he would do it, it hurt me even more. Wouldn't it hurt you even more? You're like, man, but I'd let you know. See, I let you know that that offends me. I let you know that that hurts me. And so this is what's happening is that Paul said, my will did not just change because I became aware of the will of God. And my will did not necessarily just change. And a lot of our wills did not change. We became aware of the will of God and we just have this, oh well, attitude towards God. And that's what we had. See, in verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This is not anything new that Paul is introducing us to. In, in Romans 4 and 15, he says, because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there is no transgression. In, in chapter 5 and verse 13, he said, for un until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. It's all about God now making His will known. And once there's a conflict between His will and our will, that's whenever we have to make a decision. And the commandment He said in verse 10, 
which was to bring life, I found to bring death. And in 2 Corinthians 3 and 6, Paul writes this, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not the, of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. See, when Paul is talking about moving from the law, he's not necessarily, and although it is true about moving from the law, this is what we say, we're not under law, we're under grace. Well, that's true. But the illustration that Paul is painting here, he's already painted that we're not under law, we're under grace. He's already painted that for the, through the first chapters. He's saying we're not under the, under the law, we are now under the Spirit of Christ. And so where now the law didn't bring life, the Spirit brings life. The law didn't bring any fruit, he said, it, 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 but the Spirit will bring fruit. It will have results. Something will happen in your life as a result of this. It says in verse 11, For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Now, when I'm doing my research here, and maybe in your Bibles, you will find verse 13 might be bold in the numbers. Anybody got it like that or something like that? They might even have a new heading or something like that. It's a shifting of gears. And there, it's, there's true. There is a shifting of gears. That is a good conclusion that Paul makes right there. He says, the law is holy. See, he's saying, I am so grateful for the law revealing the will of God to me, showing me that I'm sick, showing me that there's a problem. No, the law, although as a result of the arousal of the law, it brought forth these sinful passions and afflictions and sufferings that would lead to death i'm so grateful the law brought all this to light for me and i'm grateful the law is holy now i'm not under the law but the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good and that's a good conclusion to make should anybody think you know what there's anything wrong with the law? there's nothing wrong with the law the law is holy and good and perfect and you know what else is good and holy and perfect this right here I want you to hold on with me for a second, okay? This is where I'm going to get right up against the line here. Do you realize that the way that the Jews used the, the written law, the commandments, the law, the Mosaic law from given on Mount Sinai, they used it to say, hey, this is what is right. This is what is wrong. This is the do's and don'ts. And that became their God. See, that was what they were under. And their ability and how well they could score in that system is what they use to determine whether they're good and right before God. And I'm going to tell you this. Man has the same habits. And man today still uses the Bible as his current law. He does. A lot of times man uses the Bible as his current law. And I'm going to say that the Bible, I believe, was... Uh, was uh, supernaturally preserved by God. I also believe that the Bible is the final in all authority. But I also believe that there are things in the Bible that, that don't make sense in the natural realm. I mean, they don't just don't make sense in my, man's understanding. I believe that God intentionally has a whole, whole entire principles and concepts in here that can only be discerned, as Paul said to the church of Corinth, that can only be discerned by the spiritual man. It's something that's a language that God is speaking spiritually. And so there is a need for us to have the same concept of moving from the law to the spirit that I believe that the spirit of God is who we are supposed to be following. Now, the spirit of God does not contradict this word by any means, but there are people that still use the Bible. Bible today is their law. And this is what I mean. They say, well, can I drink? Well, let's look it up. Can I smoke? Well, let's look it up. <laughs> you know what? For one, I don't I, I don't think there's a, a, there's there's a clear answer on this. Can I drink thing? Now, I, I'll tell you what my position is and what I believe and how we can cause an offense. And we were talking about that earlier, but I don't think that was what God was trying to establish. Matter of fact, as we were talking about earlier, that uh, we were talking about this before church, it just so happens that we were talking about how um, Paul is, is dealing with the church at Corinth. And there was this scenario where there were meats being offered to idols. Obviously, there's other, uh, uh, you know, the, the Greeks had many gods and they had their 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 services. They had their version of church and they would have their sacrifices, just like the Jews had sacrifices and they would sacrifice this 
their meats to other gods. And they would take that meat and they would take it down to the marketplace and they would sell it. Well, guess who was down in the marketplace? Christians. Christians 2,000 years ago would go down to that marketplace and they say, oh my goodness, look over there. Matter of fact, they're Christians and they're New Testament Christians. Someone would probably say, ooh, look at that pork. I can have some of the pork ribs over there or whatever. I'm just saying. So I'm saying, look at this. Oh man, look at that lamb. That's some good looking. Mm, I want some of that lamb right there. That's good. But that lamb had just been offered to another idol and some Christians would be like, oh no, you cannot eat that lamb over there. You cannot eat that. Well, when you read, Paul says that it's just meat. So it's not about whether it's right or wrong to eat. See, this is still what people are doing. They're still trying to work in the law. It's not whether it's right or wrong to eat. People want to know, is it right or wrong to drink? Is it right or wrong to eat this meat? Paul says, what about just loving your brother? Maybe this young brother or sister of yours that is offended by you eating this meat that's offered unto idols, it's, it, it causes them to stumble. He said, no, man, why are we still trying to do this right or wrong thing whenever we have a bunch of liberty, but what we really are are servants of love. It says, man, it's about loving somebody. See, this whole, this, the spirit of Christ is a spirit of love. This is, we're walking, we're obeying the spirit. See, because I still believe that many of us are still trying to use even the word of God. And instead of depending on the spirit of God, we're depending on our intellect, intellectual comprehension of the word of God. And I, I will say this. And it's going to be my pretense going forward for the rest of chapter seven and going on in chapter eight is that this is going to require Walking with God, walking in the Spirit, serving Christ in the Spirit is going to be something that doesn't happen in the natural. What I mean, it is a supernatural event. This is what I want to say. And I want to close with verse 13. In verse 13, Paul says this. Has then, and this is not the most appropriate place to close, but I'm doing it on purpose. Has then what is good become death to me concerning the law? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Look about, look at that. Exceedingly sinful. It was wrong when the guy was using the Lord's name in vain. It came exceedingly wrong whenever he knew it was an offense to me. Now it's better to use the example with God, but you see what I'm saying. Personally, we can understand that. We can relate to that. It became exceedingly once I knew it was wrong and I continued in it. It says, the commandment become exceeding sinful. See, once an offense is made apparent, the offense continued becomes exceedingly offensive. What we have to do is accept, and this is, this is important, we have to accept that there's a conflict of wills. Now, I'm going to tell you that there is absolutely a true thing that happens between us and God where our wills become one. But I want us to be honest with ourselves. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, then we have the ability or we have the, the road is now open for that oneness in our wills with God to come to fruition is that as God is in our wills become aligned. This is what I believe is that Steve just died and God took over a part of my life. Steve is dying and God has taken over a part of my life. Now, I think some people would be uncomfortable with that. Because see, if you were to become completely and wholly aligned in your will and God's will, what if, and I'm just going to put this in there, what if that meant that you just didn't have a will anymore and it was all God's will? Would you be okay with the fact? What if God coming inside of your life and Him taking control over conquered you so much that there was nothing left in you and only God left? Would you be okay with just going into being nothing? I'm not saying that's what's happening. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I think there's something inside of us that says, no, i got to have me still. i got to have me still. That's the problem. 
That's the problem. I want to, and this is what I pray. I said, Lord, I would want you to take over my life so much that Steve is dying and you are living, you are ruling, and I am, I am dying to the point to where I'm just less, less, less. My very, what if my very existence became less to where I just didn't even exist anymore because God just completely consumed everything that was me? Again, some would be like, no, that, and I, God didn't do it just to, to obliviate us like that. I understand that. But I think the willingness that is necessary in our hearts for Him to do something like that is what it's going to take for us to be really ruled and reigned and walk in the Spirit with Him. And I don't know if that made any sense to you, but it made a lot of sense to me. But we have to accept prior to that coming to to place, we have to accept that there is a conflict of our wills and that we have failed to acknowledge the problem. In on November the third, nineteen ninety-seven, uh, and I've shared this in my testimony. But on November the third, nineteen ninety-seven, I was driving down twenty-nine seventeen or two double o four. I was driving down two double o four on the way to work, and I had been in rebellion against God. I was not walking with the Lord, and I just was uh, was done with God. And for some reason. For two weeks prior to November the 3rd, I had just started feeling convicted by God. I felt God drawing me back. The Holy Spirit was saying, Steve, you know better. The Holy Spirit was saying, this is not what you're supposed to be. You are supposed to be with me. We're supposed to be in this relationship. And I argued with God. I argued with God, and this is what I told God. I said, God, I have tried this on so many occasions, and I have failed you. I will go to church. See, what happens, God, is you call me, and I respond. Uh, As soon as you call me, I'll say, okay, I'll drop what I'm doing, and I will come, and I will go back to church, and I will stop going to the bars and drinking and smoking and doing all the things that I do. I'd go I'd go right back to you. But it wouldn't last, see? It wouldn't last. And then the next thing you know, I'd be back out in a few months or something like that. I'd be back out the bars or doing whatever I was doing, walking in the world, to the point that my friends, whenever I would respond to God calling me, they'd be like, don't worry, He'll be back. And they were right. They were right. I would come back and I would come back. And this is what I'm telling God. I said, God, I'm bad for business. I, no, I just want to tell God, I was literally saying, hey, I'm bad for business. I'm not good for you. I make you look bad. And, and I knew I was making a good case scripturally because there's a lot the Bible talks about, about how we bring a reproach against God. And I was using that in my argument, in my case against him. But he seemed to be more interested in me than he was the damage I'd done to his name. And I, Again, I argued with God and I argued with God and I said, God, I have tried, I have tried, I have tried. I just cannot do it. Talking about living right before Him and, and staying faithful and, and, and doing these things. I said, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. I just cannot do it. I'm going to tell you something. It was in that moment. There are instances in my life where I, I have heard from the Lord in my spirit Beyond the shadow of a doubt, I knew what God was saying. What God told me, He says, He says, that's all you've ever needed to say. That is all I've needed from you your whole life is to acknowledge that you can't do it. That was what God told me and it shut me up immediately and I repented and prayed on November the 3rd. When God told me that, I repented and I prayed and I've been serving Him ever since. Never went back to the bars. I've still made mistakes, but I've been serving Him ever since. I want, you, I want This is what I want to tell you about that. I had no idea what that meant when He told me. But it changed everything for me. You hear me? I had no idea what that meant for Him to say, you can't do it, but I can. Those were the words He said. You can't do it, but I can. I didn't know what that meant, but I accepted it. See, because where we're going to be going in the remainder of this chapter and, and, and into the next chapter and where we're going in this book, I, I would love right now to finish chapter 7 and go, but then I'm going to tell you something, I can't stop at the end of chapter 7. There's no stopping point for me here, really. 
I mean, I, this, this is no stopping you. Can, I'm telling you, I know now why these guys could preach in four or five hours and ten hours until people fell out of the window dead whenever Paul was preaching. Because there's just so much. I mean, you, but the reality is, is that this is what I feel led of this morning. Is that it took me actually a while to understand God saying, you can't, but I can't. Because everything about me said, I just have to try harder. Everything about me went and fell under the merit system, just like the law, under the merit system. What I got to do, what I'm going to do. And, and, and I couldn't comprehend me not accomplishing these things and doing these things. Now, where we're going to be going, we have the, the, we have the potential to go at least one or two directions. One direction is say, you know what? I can't do anything. I acknowledge that. So I don't do anything. And that's what God was saying to some people. But Paul is saying, no, I'm, I'm painting this illustration to show you that there is a conflict of wills and there's a need for something to change. And the change is going to be that we accept that we cannot do it. And that was all that was necessary for me to repent and get my life right with the Lord that day. Now, the process of learning what it means for Him to be doing it, you can't do it, but I can, to learn what that meant, that I couldn't do it, but He can, has been a process that I've been learning and I'm still learning and I'm committed to and I'm enjoying it and I'm embracing that He is doing things and I can see the fruit of His work, the fruit of His labor, and I want you to understand that, the fruit of His work and the fruit of His labor that I've seen in my life. I've also seen where I've got in His way and prevented fruit from being. But I'm telling you, I've got when I got in His way, it was His way. See, it was His will. What He's wanting to accomplish. And the, the, the thing that we're going to be learning is we're going to be learning what it looks like for Him to have His way. What it looks like for Him to have His way. But the first thing we got to do is we got to acknowledge there's been a conflict of interest. And I don't know where you're at this morning. But I think if we were to be honest, there's quite possibly several of us in here, some of us, if one of us, in this room that would say there's been a conflict of interest. And I have no problem leaving this sermon off right here with just saying, if you come to that point before God where you say, I accept that I can't do it, but you can. Show me. Teach me. Show me how you can do it. Show me how you can accomplish it.